Thank you for uh, for joining. Um, my name is Cal Delamam, and I'll be uh, presenting today in this uh, this webinar. Um, so I'll start off um, by uh, giving you some background on uh, my motivations for this talk. Um, I've been working in the general area of privacy enhancing technologies, or PETS, for uh, 16 plus years. Um, and in some cases, I was developing methodologies, and in others, I was developing software to operationalize these methodologies. Also, over that period, I've implemented or deployed these methodologies and software at more than a few hundred organizations globally in both the private and public sectors. Um, so based on that work over these years, I wanted to share some of the practical things that I've learned. Um, and of course, there are many lessons learned, uh, so I had to narrow them down to the uh, 10 um, here by focusing on some of the big picture uh, and non-technical issues. Um, these are issues that seem most relevant to organizations that are trying to use and disclose personal information for secondary purposes. So that's really my focus is secondary uses and disclosures, such as building AI and machine learning models. Um, but these are also relevant today given the current public discourse around privacy and data sharing. Um, the lessons learned are not specific to any company, jurisdiction, or regulator. Uh, they're really an aggregation across many experiences and are intended to identify and address uh, key issues and trends. Um, the main um, uh, basis for this talk is that organizations who wish to reuse their data for a secondary purpose <clears throat> um, and um, or focus on those types of organizations, and I'll discuss the various technologies that can uh, uh, support them. Um, I hope you find the material informative. The slides will be sent out afterwards, and there'll be a recording of the session, and you receive a link to the uh, YouTube uh, recording um, in, a, in a couple of days. Um, there's a lot of material to cover, so I'm not sure if we'll have a lot of time for questions at the end. If we're out of time for questions, you can always send me emails afterwards, and I'll be happy to, to answer them. So, uh, so let's see how this goes. Um, so the first thing I want to just cover quickly is around pets or privacy-enhancing technologies which is my focus. So I'm not focusing on de-identification alone. I'm defining a big umbrella on, uh, pets, on pets. Um, I think today organizations need to think of pets as a set of tools and a toolbox that they can deploy depending on the context and priorities. Um, there are multiple tools under this umbrella, and uh, de-identification is one of those tools. Um, so I'll focus on three main ones that have been used extensively and that are gaining more traction, uh, synonymization, data identification, and data synthesis. These three tools are uh, not complete alternatives to solving the same class of problems, but uh, are most par powerful in, in, in different circumstances, and we'll talk about those. An organization may deploy multiple pets in different situations. Um, so having an understanding of the alternatives available uh, enables one to make appropriate trade-offs about what technology to use and when. I'm putting federated analysis and secure computation in a separate list, and I will not address them today for a few reasons. Um, first, they are pets, um, but they're not widely deployed today, and their deployments are in uh, some very narrow circumstances. Uh, for example, federated analysis makes sense when data is distributed in multiple locations, and a pooled analysis must be performed, uh, and when pooling the data is, is a significant uh, problem. Um, these types of situations do exist, uh, for example, when we're trying to study rare diseases, there's a need to pull data from multiple locations because each location have very few observations. So you need to bring data from multiple locations to have enough observations uh, to do an analysis. Um, but I would argue that these are special cases when you need to do things like this. Um, the second reason is I'm not going to focus on those is that the implementation of either of these types of systems is quite complex. Um, there are two elements to this complexity. One is engineering complexity to set up uh, and run a distributed computation platform um, and maintain it is, is uh, not trivial. Uh, I've tried and it's hard. Um, and then the skill sets needed to reason about some of these technologies, especially secure computation and homomorphic encryption, is very difficult to find. There are very few people who, who have uh, specialist knowledge in these areas. Um, I know there are folks out there who are excited about these uh, both of these technologies. Um, so I'm just going to be very pragmatic and focus on the, uh, um, on the top three uh, uh, and really focusing them in the context of using and disclosing information for, for secondary uh, purpose. Um, okay. So um, under the, the heading of pets, let's first of all talk about consent and obligations uh, to kind of set the scene. 
and um, uh, give a context to, to what we're doing. So um, some of the main reasons for applying these three pets is to reduce the number of obligations on organizations under existing regulations when they want to use information for secondary purposes. Um, depending on the uh, jurisdiction, these obligations include the need to obtain consent, providing notice, data subject rights, such as access, portability, and rectification, security controls, data sharing agreements, data retention limitations, record keeping, and processes uh, for vendor management. Um, so I'm going to uh, group these obligations into four categories, consent, security controls, privacy controls, and contractual controls. Um, so the application of pets can reduce these obligations, at least the pets we're talking about. Then there's some very strong economic incentives to use these pets. Um, for example, some organizations want to perform secondary analysis um, in a, quote, lower level environment than the environment in which they process personal information. Um, so this lower level environment would have fewer security controls in place and have much more flexibility for the data scientist working with the data. Under these circumstances, the lower level environment would be much cheaper to operate and allow the business to achieve its business objectives much more, uh, much faster. Um, so some obligations such as providing notice are good practices to put in place anyway, even when you're using pets or uh, uh, technologies uh, such as data identification, data synthesis and so on. Transparency at this point in time is very important and uh, being transparent about how data is used and, and disclosed um, can help build up goodwill, trust, and enhance social license um, to use the data for secondary purposes. Um, some of the obligations such as consent are practically very difficult to meet in the context of secondary purposes. For example, uh, in health data, when in the health context, going back and reconsenting individuals for a new purpose for analyzing their data it's not always practical to do. For example, people move, they die, um, they're no longer seeking care. Um, the, uh, uh, the data was collected a long time ago and good records were not maintained. So sometimes it's just difficult to go back and obtain consent. Uh, but more, more importantly, I think there's a significant amount of evidence uh, for consent bias. So this means that consenters and non-consenters uh, differ systematically on important characteristics. Uh, which means that obtaining consent or reconsenting risks producing a biased data set. There's so many studies and so many systematic reviews on this issue, I, I don't think it's controversial. Um, just consenting or reconsenting introduces uh, a, a systematic bias in the data. So the evidence is, is quite strong. Um, so because of this, um, uh, uh, these pets uh, under, under certain conditions, um, uh, I'll talk about those, uh, permit the secondary analysis of data without having to obtain consent, um, uh, which makes them very attractive. So they enable secondary analysis because if you're not able to obtain consent, you have very limited options, and uh, these pets uh, help with with being able to do the secondary analysis. Um, and uh, uh, the alternatives uh, may incur significant quality pe penalty as well. So that's one of the main or big advantages is uh, it enables you to use data without having to, uh, pets are able to use data without having to go back and obtain consents. Um, the, uh, these, these pets or technologies, uh, the, uh, uh, they don't re remove these obligations completely, but they can reduce them uh, in some cases, such as pseudonymization, um, or in some cases, um, such as the identification and, and synthesis, uh, they can uh, uh, reduce them completely. Um, and also, they can uh, reduce the operating costs for, uh, uh, for doing the secondary analysis or for using the data for these, uh, for, for these secondary purposes, and sometimes significantly. Um, so these are the main drivers that uh, folks uh, uh, have used in order to apply um, these privacy-enhancing technologies, data identification, synthesization, data synthesis, et cetera. It's really to uh, enable you to use the data when consent is not possible and to reduce the operating costs um, so you don't have to uh, meet all the obligations uh, that are required uh, under the various uh, uh, regulatory regimes. The third point then I wanted to cover um, is around identifiability and, and zero risk. Um, so we, we've defined the pets, we've defined the, uh, the reasons for doing this. Um, let's now go a bit deeper and look at uh, some of the basic concepts um, around what, the, what, what they mean. 
uh, what, what do these pets really achieve? So an important concept here is um, the idea of the identifiability spectrum. Um, so you can think of identifiability um, as being a probability of assigning a correct identity to a record in a data set. Uh, because it's a probability, it varies from zero to one. At one end of this range is perfect identifiability where the probability um, of assigning a correct identity to a record is equal to one. So it's on the left side here. Um, and at the other end is zero identifiability where it is impossible to assign an identity, uh, a correct identity to a record. And so the probability of identifiability is, is zero. Um, zero risk in practice is never really achieved. Um, if your aim is to have zero risk or zero probability, then all data will have to be treated as personal information. So discussions about the impossibility of identifying a record or that a record's true identity is irreversible are goals that cannot be attained in practice. Um, in such a case, we're really talking about personal information since zero, zero risk is an impossible standard to meet. So uh, because of that, we'll just move away from the concept of zero risk and talk about a more pragmatic uh, model. So any data set can have a probability of identification along the spectrum except zero. Along the spectrum, there's a threshold value that splits the, uh, the spectrum into personal information um, and non-personal information. Uh, when the measured probability uh, in the data is above the threshold, then we have personal information. When the measured probability in the data is at or below the threshold, then we have non-personal uh, information. This threshold is then also a probability. Um, so the big question, of course, is what is, uh, what is this threshold? What should it be? Uh, in practice, there are a large number of precedents for what this threshold should be. We as a society have been uh, sharing personal or uh, non-personal information for many decades, and there are many examples of organizations around the world who have been setting thresholds and sharing data publicly and non-publicly. Um, a good example of that are the national statistical agencies, such as the Census Bureau in the U.S., Statistics Canada in Canada, Office of National Statistics in the U.K., and so on. But also there are others, such as departments of health at the state or provincial or federal levels, large health data custodians, and so on. All that to say is that the choice of a threshold and its interpretation is not really very controversial because there are so many precedents that have worked very well in practice. Another key point here is that we're able to measure the probability of identification to compare it to the threshold. Um, so there's at least 50 years of uh, literature on how to do this in the statistical disclosure control literature. Um, any such measurement of risk is based on a model of how the adversary behaves and all the models make assumptions. So there's a lot of models and a lot of assumptions that are being made. Um, some of the assumptions are strong, some are permissive, some are conservative, uh, and so on. Just because the probability is measured uh, doesn't mean that it is done well or in a reasonable way. So some models I have seen, for example, are so permissive that they will be very difficult to defend if something goes wrong, while other models for measuring identifiability uh, are so conservative that they will always inflate the risk. So the choice of model uh, matters. But this basic framework is helpful for thinking about privacy-enhancing technologies. Um, they all, to some extent, move the, uh, the risk along the spectrum from personal information to non-personal information, but they do it to different levels or different degrees. Some of them will cross the threshold and move it to non-personal information, and some will not. So the key points here really is there no zero, there's no zero risk. Uh, you need to have a good justification for the threshold. And uh, uh, it's always good to exercise due diligence on how the risk or probability is measured, just because I've seen a lot of examples of this being done um, that I found to be uh, to be questionable, to be honest. So, um, so doing doing due to doing due, due diligence on that is is, is a good idea. Um, the fourth fourth thing I wanted to cover was heterogeneity in practice, and actually this is a big topic, so I'm going to sp we'll spend a bit of time here. Um, the issue of heterogeneity is that we, we're seeing many types of organizations applying different methods and claiming all along that the probability of identification is very small or below the threshold. Um, as I mentioned, there are strong incentives to be working with data that is deemed uh, not to be personal. Um, so under this heading, I'll, be, uh, I'll try to put some structure on this heterogeneity in practice that, that uh, I've been seeing. Um, and, you know, these organizations are behaving in a very rational way, given their priorities. So really, the, the choice of uh, PET and how they apply it is driven by their priorities. At the end of this section, you should have a framework for reasoning about uh, priorities, your priorities for deciding what types of PETs to use and which ones are most suitable for, for your uh, business. So the traditional uh, trade-off when applying any um, 
uh, any of the pets we're talking about here is between how much privacy protection you get and how much data utility you get. The reasoning was that by applying pets, um, this would have a negative impact on data utility because pets imply that the data are going to be transformed. More transformations to the data mean that the data quality was being gradually reduced because the transformation would uh, generalize data, add noise, suppress data, and so on. If you wanted a high level of privacy, then you would pay for this by having a lower level of utility. So it's essentially a trade-off between uh, uh, data utility and data privacy. So basically, pets needed to solve an optimization problem by finding the best point on that curve that would uh, achieve a balance between data privacy and data utility. Good solutions or good optimization solutions would find a point somewhere along the midpoint on that curve that was simult simultaneously below the threshold and gave good utility. The ideal point on that uh, line would be right above the threshold as illustrated here where the X is. The choice of technology was therefore very important to ensure that you're operating close to that threshold to maximize data utility. In addition to data transformations, various controls were also sometimes required from the data processors or data users. Um, so you, you transform the data, but you implement controls. Controls would be a series of security and privacy practices that can be used to manage the overall risk. Therefore, the probability of identification was a function of both data transformations and the controls that were in place or that will be put in place. Various models were developed, some described in my books, um, to simultaneously assess the risk from the data and, uh, and from the controls. The advantage of this approach is that you do not need as many data transformations because there's a second lever to manage risk. Uh, putting in place uh, more controls was another way to move to a lower uh, probability on that spectrum. Um, without having to transform data. You can then get closer to that threshold and maximize your data utility. So what we have effectively done here is move the line so that at some level of, um, so at the same level of privacy protection, um, a higher level of data utility uh, can be achieved. And in general, regula regulators in many jurisdictions have been open to this concept of managing risk through a combination of data transformations and controls. Although the acceptance has not been universal because there's still this mistrust that organizations will truly um, implement the controls and maintain them. Um, the also, the other thing about controls, as I mentioned, one of the reasons to apply these pets is to reduce the obligations uh, and reduce the, uh, uh, the investment in controls. So the more controls you have to implement in order to implement your pet, uh, the, uh, the less of the benefit that you're getting uh, from not meeting your oblig obligations that I mentioned before. So it's a balancing act. Um, okay, so um, let's, uh, let's look at the different pets uh, on the data transformations versus controls uh, dimensions here. Um, so uh, some organizations will only transform uh, direct identifiers. Um, so that's the understood minimization um, uh, item one. Um, these will be things like the name, social security numbers, uh, for example. Uh, this clearly results in data sets that have a higher probability than any reasonable threshold. Um, but unfortunately, um, transforming or pseudomizing the direct identifiers only remains a common approach to protect information in the mistaken belief that it is no longer personal information. I still, I'm still seeing that uh, today. Um, but I'll put it here as a, a pseudomization technique that is currently used in, in practice. So number two is a HIPAA limited data set, which also masks uh, uh, direct identifiers. Uh, so the limited data set allows HIPAA-covered entities to share uh, pseudonymized data without patient consent or authorization for research purposes, for public health purposes, and healthcare operations. So the purposes are limited. Um, the additional control that is required under the limited uh, data set provision is that there be a data sharing agreement. So there are contractual controls um, that would cover, among other things, that the data will not be re-identified, that will, data will not be used um, to contact individuals, and um, the, these obligations have to be passed on to uh, subcontractors. So the limited data set is essentially a, a summarization of direct identifiers um, and uh, uh, contractual controls, um, and you don't need authorization, but because it's still treated as protected health information, all the security obligations under HIPAA apply. Uh, then you have GDPR pseudonymization, uh, which includes the requirement that uh, additional information that can be used to identify individuals is kept separately and is subject to technical and organizational measures to ensure that it cannot be used 
in such a way. So there are also some additional controls that are needed under GDPR optimization. Um, the, uh, because the pseudonymous data remains personal information, you also need to have um, in uh, uh, the, the appropriate controls uh, to process uh, that data because it's still considered personal information. Um, so uh, you apply your transformations to the direct identifiers and you still have additional controls in place. The second column is uh, de-identification. So de-identified data is no longer personal information, so you no longer have to meet any of the obligations um, that I mentioned before, obligations that I mentioned before. And uh, I'll talk about two methods uh, that are used in practice. First of all, HIPAA Safe Harbor, which involves removing or generalizing a fixed set of attributes. Um, so there are 18 in total. There are some provisions in the Safe Harbor that expand its scope a bit. For example, um, attribute 18 is any other uniquely identifying number, characteristic, or code, which, became, which has been interpreted quite broadly. Um, and uh, also, the covered entity must have no actual knowledge that the remaining information uh, could be used to identify um, the, the patient. Um, so in practice, um, these last two items I mentioned uh, have been applied very lightly, if at all. In the vast majority of cases, a fixed set of attributes is dealt with, and that's that. So direct identifiers are removed, and then a couple of other items are generalized um, or, or suppressed. Um, and uh, so, so essentially, the, the, the 18 items are dealt with, and the other conditions are uh, actual knowledge is, is, I have not seen that applied in practice. Um, it's acknowledged, I think, in the disclosure control community that safe harbor is not a very strong data identification standard, and I would generally not recommend it. However, for HIPAA-covered entity, applying the standard allows the box to be checked and the data to be declared de-identified, and then you don't have to meet these four obligations that I mentioned before. Also, the safe harbor standard um, has been copied in various ways globally. It's attractive because it's very simple to understand and apply. But when you talk about applying it globally, uh, the empirical basis um, for, uh, um, for the HIPAA Safe Harbor Standard is some analysis that was done uh, on the U.S. Census data. Um, so its international application is questionable. Nevertheless, that's the current status. Risk-based identification is method number two under the de-identification column. Uh, combines statistical methods for measuring the probability of identification and application of robust controls to further manage the risk of identifiability. And then the last column is synthetic data. So I'll talk about fully synthetic data. And these are methods for uh, they're increasingly being applied to create fake or, or artificial data. So synthetic data retains many of the statistical properties of the original data, uh, but they do not have a one-to-one -one mapping between the synthetic records and real people. A common way to create a synthetic data set is to take a real data set, build a model from that real data set to capture its uh, distributions and correlational structure, and then use that model to generate new data that has the same characteristics as the original data. So it's another, another way to enable this uh, secondary uh, analysis. Um, so this is a characterization of the different pets and how they uh, uh, fare on the data transformation versus, versus control spectrum. But in practice, really, uh, organizations do not make decisions about which pets to deploy based only on the balance between uh, data privacy and data utility. There are typically four main factors that uh, people use in practice. Um, one, of course, is the extent of privacy protection. Um, and this comes down to well, whether the um, threshold is acceptable and if the measured risk is below the threshold. The second factor is data utility, which achieves the business objectives. Um, the, the, the level, whether the extent to which the, the data utility helps achieve the business objectives. Um, maximizing data utility is actually not a universal objective. Uh, for example, uh, when you use non-personal data for software testing, you may have a lower data utility requirement than if you're using a data set, uh, you're giving it to data scientists to drive innovation around clinical trial recruitment, for example. So there are different degrees of um, uh, acceptable um, data utility. Um, as another example, a company that's required by regulation to make their non-personal data available to third parties may not want to emphasize data utility because they don't, they don't perceive that uh, maximizing data utility um, is, uh, is to their benefit or, or brings them any significant returns. 
Um, also, the priority given to data utility is affected by what the organization was used to before implementing PETS. For example, if the analysts in the organization were used to getting raw data, then they will expect very high data utility. Uh, when, when they get um, data that has been transformed in some way. If, on the other hand, the analysts were not getting any data in the past, then getting any useful data, even if it's been transformed uh, quite a bit, will be seen as a plus. So the perception of a good enough, uh, uh, good enough data utility will depend on the history um, uh, of that organization. The next item, of course, is cost, uh, which is also important. So there are two types of costs. The first is implementation cost, which is the cost of implementing the privacy enhancing technologies. Um, I won't talk about these costs because they're, they'll be vendor dependent. Uh, but the second type of cost is relevant because it's operational cost. So this is the cost of maintaining the infrastructure and the controls to process the data after it has gone through the PET. And then finally, there's brand and reputation of the organization. Brand has an impact on trust and whether consumers or patients will want to continue to transact with a particular organization. And in the healthcare context, it's known that patients adopt privacy-preserving behaviors when they are concerned about how their information will be used, such as not seeking care, self-treating, self-medicating, or omitting vital details in their interactions with their physicians. There's also some evidence that the lack of trust in health IT products is um, slowing the adoption of these um, IT, health IT products, despite there being some support, um, uh, being data to support the benefits from adopting that technology. So all this means is that um, the multiple factors that need to be balanced when, uh, when choosing um, a, a privacy-enhancing technology uh, within, the, uh, uh, within the organization. And so we will look at those uh, now. Oops. Okay. So um, just... Fit. Just bear with me for a second. Okay. So there is another kind of trade-off which is important between cost and data utility. Uh, for example, implementing a high level of controls um, uh, entails higher operational costs, as we can see. Um, this becomes more acceptable when the data utility is also high. Um, so for example, um, uh, the ideal is when there is low operational cost and high data utility, which is the lower left quadrant in this diagram. Um, the, uh, the top right quadrant is when you have high data transformations and high controls. Um, and this is the uh, least attractive, of course, because you have high operational cost and low data utility. Um, the top left quadrant, you have uh, few data transformations and high controls. Um, so you get high utility, but it, 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 it's costly. Um, so a number of the pets fall into that quadrant, um, and then the, uh, the bottom right one is uh, when you have few controls and uh, high data transformations, um, which is when you apply um, uh, uh, pets um, without, any, without any controls, you end up um, putting in place, uh, implementing a lot of transformations, which is typically what happens with open data, uh, especially as um, uh, the complexity of data sets that folks are trying to share in an open manner increases. But this is another trade-off that has to be considered between cost and utility. It's not just uh, utility and privacy. Cost is an important factor in this equation. So now let's talk about a model that allows us to select the appropriate pet given the key drivers here. Um, so first of all, just on this, um, uh, in this diagram, um, the, uh, the transform direct identifiers approach um, is, is assumed to have no controls here. I'm just keeping it in, in, in this picture because it's, it's still being applied um, in practice. Um, and then one other assumption before I walk through some examples is that um, the, uh, we assume here that um, when we compare methods that uh, they're applicable to the same use cases. So, so there, there's an uh, underlying assumption that the particular use case we're looking at uh, can be solved using um, any of these six approaches. But this is an interesting exercise just to understand the strengths and weaknesses of different, uh, of different pets. Um, so the values in the, uh, uh, here are rankings. Um, so they just reflect an order uh, and nothing else. For example, we can see that transforming direct identifiers and HIPAA safe harbor have the uh, lowest ranking on privacy because they transform a very small subset of the data and they require um, no, uh, no additional controls. 
So in practice, um, their measure on the identifiability spectrum will be quite a bit higher than, uh, than any practical uh, uh, threshold. Um, but there are also um, the two methods which will have the lowest operational cost, so the most attractive from an operational cost uh, uh, perspective. Then you can add weights. So the weights here um, reflect the importance assigned to each of the drivers of, um, by the organization. So in this example, we first assume that all the drivers are given equal weight. And of course, all the weights have to be uh, add up to one. Um, and then the score at the bottom, bottom is a normalized average rank, um, and I've scaled it so that higher values are, are better. So we can just get an understanding of uh, why the heterogeneity exists and why organizations make decisions about different, different paths. So let's look at the, uh, in a neutral uh, situation, for example, we see that HIPAA um, safe harbor is the least preferred option, um, uh, which has the uh, uh, lowest score. And then uh, data identification and data synthesis are, are uh, ranked the highest. By changing the weights to another kind of uh, set of priorities, so here is an or a type of organization, and we also see those types of organizations where they emphasize strongly operational cost and data utility and are de-emphasizing uh, privacy and uh, brand and reputation. Um, and uh, in this example then, um, the uh, uh, just transforming the direct uh, identifiers um, is the best option, um, but uh, methods like HIPAA Safe Harbor are also quite attractive. Um, and we see that happening as well. Organizations that are um, making a deliberate decision uh, but are driven by cost and utility uh, factors as, as being the most important, they do tend towards uh, uh, basic uh, transformations of direct identifiers and use of HIPAA Safe Harbor. Um, and then finally, organizations, is flipping the priorities here, where privacy and brand and reputation are a high priority and cost and utility um, take, take a, a lower priority, then uh, you see that direct transformations in Safe Harbor are, are least attractive and more sophisticated pets become more attractive. So if you think of organizations as rational decision makers, uh, the choice of a privacy enhancing technology for any particular um, project will be uh, can be explained in a rational way depending on, on their priorities. And um, these are my rankings uh, based on my experience. And uh, from my perspective, they, they actually reflect, as you play around with this, they actually reflect the behavior and the choices that are made uh, in the field um, reasonably well. So it's not mysterious. There's heterogeneity. It's a rational heterogeneity. And it's driven by the priorities of the organizations. There are four priorities that typically drive those decisions or four factors that drive those decisions and how they are prioritized will have, uh, uh, if you think again of organizations, rational actors um, can be explained um, uh, quite reliably. Okay, so let's move on to the next important topic I think uh, uh, we need to cover is identity disclosure. So an, an important question that needs to be answered is what exactly um, are these uh, uh, pets protecting against? Uh, there's been some confusion about what we are actually protecting against, which means that the appropriate mechanisms are not always put in place. And the reasoning I'm going uh, to give here is pragmatic. Data utility is often important, especially if you have a data science, data analytics team that's working with, with data for secondary purposes. Um, and if we transform data to such an extent that we diminish utility significantly, uh, then really there's no point in the exercise. Um, so uh, let me focus here on three types um, that of, of disclosures that we would normally want to protect against. Um, the identity disclosure, attribute disclosure, and learning something new. The other type of disclosure, which is also important, membership disclosure, I'm not really going to cover that here just because we won't have enough time. I'll just focus on the top three. So let's go through them and see what they mean. So here's an example. Um, of um, a data set with three records and two variables, origin and income. We have an adversary who's trying to uh, re-identify um, Hiroshi, and uh, the adversary knows that Hiroshi is in the data set and that he is Japanese. So the adversary can now learn that the first record in this data set uh, belongs to Hiroshi and that Hiroshi's income is 120K. So this is an example of identity disclosure where we are able to assign a record, which is record number one, to a person or identity, which is Hiroshi, with high certainty. 
So identity disclosure is the main type of disclosure that we're trying to protect against when applying those pets. Sitemization, the identification synthesis, and so on. So we want to make sure that this assignment has a low probability of being successful. Another example here is uh, we have another data set with five records. Um, and the adversary knows that Hiroshi is in the data set and he was born between 1950 and 1959. And, there are, um, uh, and in this case, there are three records that match. So the adversary does not know which record belongs to Hiroshi. It's one of those three. But he knows that Hiroshi is part of that group. However, the adversary knows um, um, from the data that members of that group have been diagnosed uh, with prostate cancer. By virtue of this group membership, we learn something about Hiroshi without knowing which record belongs to him. So we don't know that which record belongs to Hiroshi. It's one of those top three, but we know that he's been diagnosed with prostate cancer. So what I just show you is, is the essence of data analysis. In this example, we built a very simple model whereby we use input characteristics, in this case, decade of birth and gender, to determine the diagnosis. We don't want to modify or transform the data to limit, cripple, or inhibit such inferences. If we do that, then we are compromising the utility of the data in a very significant way. When we have a model, we also control inferences about individuals who are not in the data. So, for example, if Satoshi is not in the data but belongs to the same population and he was born in 1955, then we can draw the same diagnosis about him too. He is diagnosed with prostate cancer. Um, so it will be very detrimental to the ability to use data for secondary analytics purposes if we try to limit this kind of attribute disclosure and ability to draw inferences from, uh, about groups from the data. But this is exactly what some guidelines, including from regulatory authorities, are proposing to do when they talk about methods like L-diversity and T-closeness. We do not want to prohibit statistics. The risk from attribute disclosure uh, in practice is that a data analyst would use the model to harm Satoshi and Hiroshi for example, by denying them bank loans or discriminating against them. So uses of data and models that are deemed inappropriate can be managed through governance mechanisms such as ethics reviews. Data use protocols would be reviewed by some oversight group that would determine the appropriateness of the analysis and the decisions that will be made from the data and the models. That's how you manage the risk of attribute disclosure rather than by trying to apply pets to manage attribute disclosure. Um, the last example I'll look at is uh, when the adversary knows all the values in the data set and hence can determine that the first record belongs to Hiroshi. So here we have an adversary who was able to determine correctly that record number one belonged to Hiroshi. So this is a case of identity disclosure. However, the adversary did not learn anything new. Uh, it, is, it is essentially an exercise with no consequence. In such a case, the identity disclosure was not meaningful. One can make a strong argument that identity disclosure should be meaningful for it to be considered a problem, and pets should be able to protect against meaningful identity disclosure. My key message here is that instead of spending time trying to evaluate how well pets solve things like attribute disclosure or the attribute disclosure problem, a more effective approach is to implement an ethics review process and evaluate pets on their ability to protect against meaningful identity disclosure. I've seen a lot of energy spent on technical approaches for managing attribute disclosure, and I just think it's a misspent energy. Put in an ethics review process, that's the best way to manage inferences and attribute disclosure risks. So let's talk about regulatory uncertainty and inconsistency. So for whatever it's worth, I have also observed some general behaviors by privacy regulators globally um, over the years uh, and observed the impact of these behaviors and what actually happens in the marketplace and in practice. Uh, some regulators are more conservative, others are more pragmatic. There's certainly heterogeneity there as well. But let me just discuss two very specific things. The first is around uh, uncertainty. So this occurs when a regulator does not address a key open question that organizations are struggling with in their jurisdiction. For example, a question maybe about consent or, or uh, uh, whether an approach to data anonymization is acceptable or not. There are many questions. By not addressing an issue, this creates uncertainty in the marketplace. Uncertainty is not good because in practice it leads to paralysis. Organizations generally do not want to take a risk, spend money, and make the wrong decisions where there is uh, significant uncertainty. Therefore, oftentimes, they will simply do nothing and defer a decision. This has con the consequence of putting the brakes on innovation and businesses bringing new products and solutions to the market. So reducing uncertainty is really important if you want to um, 
um, uh, reducing uncertainty is always going to be better than, than, than maintaining uncertainty. It doesn't, at the end of the day, it may not actually matter what the answer is as long as uncertainty is, is reduced by making a decision and providing some clarity to the marketplace about what practices are deemed to be, to be appropriate. Um, and the second observation is around inconsistency. So inconsistency can occur uh, at the same time among different parts of an organization or over time. For obvious reasons, um, this creates significant problems in the marketplace similar to the impact of uncertainty. Um, and the situation is more pronounced with technology and technological questions where different parts of the regulatory organization have different and sometimes inconsistent interpretations of how that technology works, its risks, and its benefits. Um, again, um, it's, uh, the, the, the existence of inconsistency leads to uh, uncertainty about what the right approach and right behavior and right uh, uh, methods to use are, and uh, oftentimes this leads to a decision not being made and uh, putting the brakes on, on innovation. Um, so uh, it's important from a regulatory perspective to reduce uncertainty in the marketplace. Um, different mechanisms for doing that, of course, uh, because that helps um, uh, businesses make decisions. Social license. Another big factor here um, when using and disclosing data for secondary purposes, and the importance of this, of course, has increased quite dramatically um, in the last few years. The public is getting very worried about how data is being used for secondary purposes and, um, and being used in surprising ways, and so are regulatory bodies and legislators. The practical impact is uh, an unwillingness of consumers or patients to transact with certain organizations, increased scrutiny by authorities and pressure for restrictive legislation, and also, of course, there's damage to the brand and reputation of these organizations. And there are known examples of initiatives that have been canceled, postponed, delayed uh, because of uh, public um, pushback um, represented by civil society and the media and academia and so on. So uh, these have uh, typically been... Uh, um, the examples we know have been public organizations or public-private partnerships um, where the information becomes known in the, in, the, in the public domain, but there are also examples in the private sector as well. In any case, uh, ensuring that secondary data use and disclosure efforts are transparent and do not surprise the data subjects are two good rules to, to live by. Um, this brings us back to governance and uh, having ethics oversight uh, on the data uses and disclosures. The role of governance would be to help the organization maintain the social license uh, for its activities, and sometimes um, sometimes it'll be necessary to say no, that certain data uses uh, uh, are, are going to be problematic um, from a uh, the social license uh, perspective. Um, I think another key thing to keep in mind, which is also happening, is and it's driving the social license um, conversation and narrative or the media stories that we see. Um, in many cases, the media stories are based on academic articles. Unfortunately, there's often a disconnect between the media stories and the evidence in the articles. Um, evidence in the articles, and sometimes I wonder if anyone has actually read the articles. In any case, the academics and their institutions are optimizing on their own criteria, so this kind of publicity is a positive thing for them. The impact, of course, is that organizations start to question certain practices. As I mentioned earlier, uncertainty is not good in that it leads to a reduced ability to make decisions. But negative nar narratives always um, also chip away at public trust, which in turn has an, has an impact on social license. So my recommendation here is to focus on telling the, the story of the benefits of data use and disclosure. This is easier to do, for example, if your business is health research or, and curing diseases and developing drugs and so on. Um, but nevertheless, uh, many organizations have historically chosen to stay under the radar so as not to bring attention to themselves. This has left the floor uh, to only one side of the story being told, the risk side, not the benefit side. It's important for the benefit side of the story to be told as well, and organizations that use and disclose information for secondary purposes need to take a lead here before it becomes too late and the negative narrative becomes uh, the dominant one with little room for discussion. Um, all right, let's talk about changes in the uh, environment. Um, another topic that has come up quite quite a bit over the last uh, few years. Uh, so there's some arguments being made that our world and environments are changing and such changes will diminish the effectiveness of privacy enhancing technologies. Uh, for example, computing power is increasing at a rapid clip that will make identification of individuals and data much easier or the mosaic effect where there's so much data out there that it's becoming easier to create detailed profiles of uh, individuals. 
or that AI is improving uh, the match rate of data to real people, and so it become easier over time. And all of this is, is true to some extent, but there are important caveats as well that one, one must keep in mind, and I'll mention a few of them here. Um, so one argument that has been made pertains to the curse of dimensionality, which means that every piece of information about an, about an individual in any database can be used to identify them because all of that uh, information is known somewhere by someone and will be available to an adversary or a potential adversary. Um, so there are two, two uh, counter arguments here. Uh, one is that data has errors and uh, the more data you have doesn't necessarily mean that your ability to match data with people improves because the errors impact accumulates. Um, and in practice, adversaries don't really have unlimited knowledge. Um, we, we can see that from the at least the known re-identification attacks or attacks on data sets. Adversaries did use limited knowledge and limited information. Um, the other argument that's, argument that's been made is that technology keeps improving. And so uh, an analogy that I often make is with cryptography, is another domain where technology is improving and the improvements in technology can diminish the effectiveness of uh, encryption methods, for example. Um, it is documented, uh, however, in, in which years um, everyone should switch the, uh, to larger key sizes. So. Um, um, this is intended to protect against improved computing capacity that would enable successful attacks on encrypted information. Um, so we, we, we have a timeline for, for using particular key sizes. Um, but until we reach that deadline for switching to larger key size, we, can, we, sh we continue and we have continued using the key sizes that are in effect today, even though we know when, when, this will, uh, when technology will advance enough to make that uh, encrypted information vulnerable. So all that to say, we have to use the best available tools today to protect information and to enable societies to function in a modern world. If we stop using best known practices available today because they will be found wanting in the future, then we'll, we will not progress. Thankfully, we don't do that in the case of um, application of cryptographic methods, and there's no reason to, add, to adopt um, that uh, stance, that precautionary stance in the case of pets, especially when there's, uh, uh, there's more uncertainty in, in the cryptographic space as to when, because we actually have a uh, information about when keys should be switched. The reason this is a relevant issue is that I've seen organizations hesitate in their application of pets because of these concerns. It's always good to ask hard questions, but it's still necessary to make decisions, even when the risk is, risk is not zero. The other thing I think is important to uh, cover is that algorithms matter. Um, and this seems like an obvious uh, thing to say, but it's important to emphasize it. Um, pets very often embody an optimization algorithm that attempts to find the best balance between, for example, data privacy and data utility, as we saw earlier. There are many optimization algorithms, and some are very good at solving certain problems. Uh, good algorithms will give you a better result with better privacy protection and better data utility. As the complexity um, of data uh, increases, the need for good algorithms will also increase, um, and different solutions are not exchangeable because one may have a better algorithm than another, even if, even within the same category of pets. So we saw this picture before, and um, uh, the key point here is that the second line uh, can also mean a better algorithm, um, which, which enables you to achieve a better result. So in this case, for the same level of privacy, a better algorithm can give you a higher level of utility. Um, so therefore, it's, it's worth investing and developing and deploying better algorithms in your pets. Um, the algorithms uh, do, do matter. Um, they're not all, all, all equal. Um, the other key point along this um, dimension is um, that innovation continues. Um, there's an ongo there are ongoing efforts to attack privacy-enhancing technologies, mostly done by academics in the media, and more recently by competitors as well. And uh, you know, to some extent, this is healthy if some basic white hat uh, hacking protocols are followed. And the narrative about these attacks maintains a close uh, correlation to the actual data. Uh, unfortunately, this is not necessarily how things happen all the time. Uh, but in any case, uh, my point here is that innovation to improve uh, technologies also uh, is also ongoing at the same time as these attacks are ongoing. 
and the innovators do learn from successful attacks. And it's important to remember that there is a counterbalance which does not always uh, get as much attention. Um, there's a large research community in academia and industry that are regularly improving uh, data identification methods and data synthesis methods, for example. Um, and uh, in that regard, I'll just mention a couple of things. Uh, one is that uh, I'm involved in the special issue on privacy enhancing technologies, which we're hoping will be showcasing some uh, advances in, in pets, uh, covering all the types of things we just uh, discussed uh, so far. Um, I'll, uh, um, in the materials after this, I'll make sure you get uh, the information about the special issue. So if you have a paper or an article in progress, please consider submitting it to the special issue. Um, it's a good way to uh, uh, promote and, uh, and discuss and present uh, some of the things that um, I have covered um, in, this, uh, in this webinar. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, we're publishing two books, um, which should be coming out in the next few months. Uh, one uh, um, uh, more recent uh, text on uh, anonymization and another one on synthetic data. Um, so two of the pets that we discussed, again, as I mentioned, there's a very active community working on improving um, uh, pets from an applied perspective and from a, a technology perspective, um, and therefore, um, um, again, I'll send you more details on these once they're out. Uh, if you're subscribing to O'Reilly Safari, you can probably access uh, early, early release copies of these uh, right now. Um, but in either case, uh, you should be able to get them uh, in the next uh, next couple of months when they're when they're fully out, which should be around the May April May timeframe. The last point I wanted to make is that privacy has a competitive advantage. Um, a few years ago, I, would have, I was not very convinced that organizations that invested in improving their privacy posture gained a real competitive advantage. Um, this was based on the observation that organizations that adopted poor privacy practices and uh, specifically practices for using and disclosing data for secondary purposes were able to compete effectively still with those that did make those investments. Basically, the market didn't care and was not in, or was not informed enough to tell the difference. A few years ago, I changed that statement to a question. Can privacy be a competitive advantage? Does the market care? Now I think I've come around and I can say, um, uh, I can see that privacy is increasingly giving organizations a competitive advantage. The re regulatory, brand, and financial risks from not getting privacy right and not um, having uh, good practices for using and disclosing data for secondary purposes are increasing at a rapid pace. Um, so this is why the, uh, the points that I brought earlier for how to position uh, privacy-enhancing technologies and how to apply privacy-enhancing technologies and how to choose ones that are suitable for your business objectives uh, are, are important. Um, so that was the last point I wanted to make. Um, I th think we can uh, have some questions right now. Um, so I will... Um, wait for you to ask questions in the last couple of minutes. Um, as we are uh, waiting, I will uh, just mention that um, at the end uh, of the webinar, like I said, you'll get the slide deck and you'll get a couple of additional items with the uh, 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 call for papers, um, and then the video should be available for you um, in the uh, in the next little uh, little while, the next couple of days. So, um, if you have any questions, please type them. So, um, one question was, um, can you comment on artificial intelligence as it is being used to review patient databases for including patients in studies? Um, so, um, yes, I mean, I think that um, AI can be a very powerful tool for identifying patients that are uh, suitable or, or, or that, that meet the criteria for, for participation in studies. Um, the, the way this is done, though, is, is important. Um, if, if the... Uh, Arguably, this is a secondary use of data. Um, so there are various protocols that can be used to um, uh, apply uh, 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 data protection methods to, to, to that data set to 
uh, identify patients uh, that are uh, el- eligible, and then you send essentially a key to the physician who would contact those patients, uh, match the key with the real person, and then contact the patients and, and ask them to participate in studies. Um, so this can work very, uh, very well in practice and has been implemented uh, quite well, uh, quite extensively in practice as well. Uh, but I think a lot of the things we discussed today are relevant in that in that situation, um, because arguably this is a form of secondary use of data. Um, have Canadian privacy commissioners accepted, endorsed the uh, scoring methodology you described, and have any commented on minimum scores thresholds? Um, no, uh, this is this is something that I use to uh, help uh, characterize and understand what's happening uh, in, in the marketplace, to uh, uh, guide and help organizations uh, choose technologies that are suitable given their priorities. Um, so um, it's really a tool for the users of technology uh, more than anything else. Um, it's not it's not driven by any regulatory requirements per se. Um, Can you confirm that commitment to perform pseudonymization and or de-identification releases the application of the data controller to obtain patient consent for secondary use of data in Europe? Uh, I wouldn't say that, no. Um, I think pseudonymization helps with uh, meeting your obligations under uh, the GDPR. I'm assuming this is under the GDPR. Um, But it doesn't relieve you from the need to obtain consent necessarily. if you can make a legitimate interest argument, that certainly can can be the basis for for processing the data. Uh, but if you can make a legitimate interest argument, um, then uh, summarization doesn't relieve you from obtaining uh, having to obtain consent. It can help you meet some of your other obligations, and we've written a paper on that uh, around um, how uh, various pets can can help you with the obligations. Um, so I'm happy to share that with 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 you as well. But it doesn't relieve you, you know, and, and, and as as a blanket statement, it doesn't relieve you from the need to obtain uh, uh, consent. I wouldn't make that statement. Um, what impact do you think the identified sanitized data will have when training AI solutions, including the potential for creating bias? Um, it depends on the methods that you're using for for. Uh, uh, Protecting your data, um, but in general, uh, you know methods such as uh, the identification, um, uh, all the examples I spoke about, and, and data synthesis as well, uh, will retain the statistical properties of the original data. Um, so any bias that exists in the original data will be maintained in the the identified or synthesized data. Um, so managing bias requires an additional layer of control or, or governance or methodology um, to deal with that. Um, there's a question about uh, differential privacy. Um, so I didn't really talk about differential privacy. There are a number of reasons um, for that. One is um, just didn't have time to cover it. It's, it describing differential privacy um, requires um, a bit of time to go through how it works so that everyone understands uh, the, how it's operationalized. Um, but I think there are also uh, questions uh, that um, uh, need to be answered about uh, uh, the acceptable risk levels for a differentially private data set. And uh, it is being applied at, at scale by some organizations. Um, the transparency of these applications is not always great. So the, the amount of knowledge about these applications, I would say, is limited. Um, but it's an evolving uh, picture here, and I think more information will be forthcoming in uh, hopefully this year. Um, by some large organizations that are using differential privacy, and so we can learn how well it works in practice. Um, I think uh, it's becoming an important methodology uh, over time, um, and I expect to see its application in practice to increase. But still, I think there, there's some some questions that need to be answered before um, I, I would say this is uh, it's a mainstream approach. Um, Okay, I think I'll have, have one more time for one more question just to be respectful of everyone's time. And then afterwards, if you want to send me an email, um, this is my email address. You can send me an email afterwards if you have any additional questions. Um, so the last question would be, um, how do we deal with the challenges conversation of data that might be deemed to meet the identification threshold now? 
but evolution of technologies means that in the future they don't meet the identification threshold once the data is out there. Um, well, so there, there are two things. I mean, typically you'd have a buffer. Um, so uh, most models for estimating uh, risk are conservative. And so there's already a built-in buffer, but you can also explicitly add a buffer so that even if the threshold shifts over time, um, um, then uh, you still have the buffer space um, to, uh, to to give you some room. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, um, I mean, there are, there are ways to manage the ways to manage this risk. You can put in controls in place um, um, and, and revisit the data on a regular basis. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the other argument is that there's never going to be zero risk. Um, and uh, the the if you do this well, so if your risk of indication is much lower than the threshold, then it'll take quite a bit of time. Um, for the for the actual risk to to uh, uh, increase to get closer uh, back up closer to the threshold, so there are different ways through con conservative conservatism or erring on the conservative side and, and by using buffers and making uh, uh, some conservative assumptions in your model to to allow for this to happen without being overly aggressive uh, and limiting uh, data utility. Um, it has worked well in practice so far. Um, many of the cases of successful attacks on data were, were done on pseudonymous data. Um, so that, that did not even meet the thresholds, uh, any, any meaningful thresholds. Um, so um, but yeah, that's, that's where, we have, where we have been so far in terms of uh, uh, actual risks. Um, okay, I think we're done because we are, we're out of time. If you have any more questions, again, send me an email. I'm happy to answer them. Uh, thank you for joining. Hopefully you found it useful. Um, and i um, hoping to connect with you in the future. Uh, as we continue this conversation. Thank you.